part of the Earglue Media family of podcasts. You're listening to Petticoats and Poppies. History Girls at the Movies. Welcome to Petticoats and Poppies, History Girls at the Movies. We're your hosts, Maggie and Nicole. Today, we're going to be discussing one of my favorite holiday movies and actually my favorite movie musical of all time, Mimi and St. Louis. We wanted to discuss some, you know, period dramas that have some holiday themes in them. And I've been wanting to talk about a period film that was made before 1960 for a long time. So this felt like a perfect fit. I agree. So what have you been watching? Mostly, I'm in that period of the year, and this year is obviously a little bit weird because uh, award season is slightly so different. So many awards. We're stuck <laughs> in it until April. God help me make it through. But I can't. I can't feel. <laughs> I can't even think about it. Um, but I've mostly been watching award screeners. Um, I actually Same. literally just finished watching Minari, which is really lovely. Um, my oh. favorites have been uh, One Night in Miami, which is really amazing. Uh, Sylvie's Love, which is a gorgeous period drama with uh, Tessa Thompson in the lead. Yes. That might be something that we could uh, look into maybe doing an episode on at some point. I think I have that sitting over on my shelf right now because I, I just okay. got a whole bunch of SAG screeners and I haven't haven't had a chance to go through Sylvie's them. Love is one of my favorite movies of the whole year. You definitely need Ooh, to watch it. I and I wait. also have watched Promising Young Woman twice already. Oh. Uh, I love Carrie Mulligan and... I also, we talked in our last episode about um, Emerald Fennell in uh, Vida in Virginia, and she's the writer and director of Promising Young Woman. So it's it's a really, really impressive directorial debut. Uh, I also recently saw, for the first time, I think, or the first time at least since I was in like middle school, the uh, period drama Merchant Ivory film, A Room with a View. So I good. was on my friend Kevin Jacobson's uh, podcast and the runner up talking about that. And God, what a gorgeous movie. I love young Helena Bottom Carter Isn't period it films. wonderful? Oh, it's so good. I want to like live in that movie. Um, and I will also plug that my review of Ammonite recently came out uh, on the website In Their Own League, which uh, do let us know if anyone would be interested in a full podcast on that because I did, <laughs> in my review, go into a little bit that um, – the historical inaccuracies in the film and the way in which the actual women it's based on are so much more interesting than uh, what what the film shows us. So I think that might be a fun one for us to review at some point. If any of our listeners want that, do let us know. Yes, I am really interested to see that. I keep seeing all of like the, the praise for it on TV and I was like, eh, but Nicole said otherwise. <laughs> so everyone I know who has seen it has been pretty disappointed by it but it's one of those movies where, like, the performances are great. The sound work is really amazing. Mm-hmm. The score is really nice. The costumes are really lovely. It just doesn't come together. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's almost, like, worse for that in that, like, it's like, oh, you were so close. So close. So um, what have you been – what, what award screeners oh have you God. been up to? So I currently have a stack of Netflix screeners sitting next to me. I think I've watched most of them already because it's, um, like, dead to me and things like that. And mm-hmm. I do I do watch a lot of Netflix TV shows. Also, I just want to say um, Amazon sends the nicest for your consideration packages. Oh. Um, I got this really cute um, box that came that says, like, for your consideration. And it's one of those, like, the little circle that you, like, unwind the string from. And it has a journal. It has um, with, like, pictures from all of their TV shows and movies um, with little, like, paper clips inside. It has a stack of postcards <laughs> with oh my quotes from all of their tv shows and um i think post-it notes and a pencil so that's cute yeah um and ironically i also am now getting screeners um from amazon for my job as well so <laughs> i just did my very first tv review and watched the wilds which um I was kind of leery of it at first because I am not a huge fan of Lost and it kind of billed itself as being very Lost-like. Uh, but the show is amazing and I cannot wait to see everybody like watching it. It premieres tonight because uh, it's really good and 
absolutely mind bending. And then I'm also working my way through small acts, um, which I mentioned on the last yes. the last episode of the podcast. Really good. I'm really disappointed that more film Twitter isn't talking about it. So snap, snap, get to it. Um, I have it all sitting in my inbox. Um, it doesn't need to be watched in order, does it? No. Okay. Okay. Because I really John Boyega watch- though. Yeah, that's. I yes. was like, I really want to watch uh, Red, White, and Blue, even if I don't get to the others for a while. Yes, I went to a, a SAG event, a digital SAG Ooh. event last week. Um, that was a it was a pre recorded interview of him talking mm-hmm. about his role, and it was just really interesting. Oh, he's um, he's so thoughtful when he's talking about the roles that he yeah. plays and the research that he does, and it's just it's it's very interesting. Um, yeah, he's definitely high on my list of people <laughs> I'd like to see nominated. It's always funny to me to discuss. Um, with you like what you get for fyc stuff as a member of oh my SAG gosh, so much versus what i get as like a, a film critic and a I, i'm can a member i just tell of, you my email is oh yeah oh no God. like i i had to make an entire folder in my email just to put all of the emails yes. in there especially because this year Me like too. a lot of the um studios have gone to doing just uh just, just screener digital. links instead mm-hmm. of yeah instead of sending the dvds um, but I did get, I'm very proud of this. It's my, it's my baby now. Um, I did get the neon book of, oh. of DVDs, which is, you know, that's, I feel like that's how, you know, you've like made it as a yes. film critic. <laughs> which, was, and for anyone listening, I get them because I'm a member of the North Carolina Film Critics Association. Because she's awesome. <laughs> not as cool as you are. I'm, I'm, I'm not, not, you know. You're pretty awesome. I, I will say my uh, my current thing that I'm like obsessively checking my email box for, I'm on the wait list for Wonder Woman 1984. Oh my God. And like, I keep being like, hey, I, I worked on that. Please yeah, like, let please. me see it early. Um, <laughs> so fingers crossed. Either way, like I've seen myself in like four trailers, so I'm fine. <laughs> oh my God. Well, I will also say if you get on the, uh, Over the Moon from Netflix, the DVD screener of it, Make sure you look on the inside of it because it does have a quote from me. Seriously? So, oh my gosh. Yeah. I, I'll have to track. <laughs> I checked it because I do have a whole – I got two envelopes full of Netflix screeners. Yeah. So if, if you got that one, oh I gosh. am – my review. As soon is, as we're it done. Says, <laughs> it says next best picture and it's it's from my review. Aww, so that makes me so happy for you. Mm-hmm. See, you are cool. <laughs> well, all right. So now, now we'll talk about what we're here to talk about. Um, although, like, if our readers ever have any – questions for us about sort of what we do uh in terms of the film industry and yes and because my job has changed since my very first mm-hmm. episode of this podcast so yes it has <laughs> in a big way literally the next day <laughs> oh man what a year it's been what a year yeah let's talk about a movie which is i think one of the most like beautifully nostalgic films i've ever seen uh, Meet Me in St. Louis came out in November of 1944, another tumultuous year. Um, it was made by MGM. Um, it was directed by uh, Vincent Minnelli, uh, who would later go on to marry Judy Arlen. Um, and it was written by Irving, I think it's Brecher, and Fred F. Finkelhoff. <laughs> I don't I don't know if I, I hope I'm saying that right because that's delightful. Uh and it was actually based on these short stories by Sally Benson that were later published as a book, uh, you know, and put all together. The film stars Judy Garland and Margaret O'Brien, uh, as well as Mary Astor, Lucille Brimmer, Tom Drake, Leon Ames, Marjorie Maine, June Lockhart, and Joan Carroll. And it's essentially a set of seasonal vignettes that begin in the summer of 1903 but the christmas section of the film is sort of what it's best known for uh particularly in the way they get popularized the song which was written for it uh have yourself a merry little christmas it is a family drama about this sort of upper middle class family living in saint louis and i think it's interesting because considering whenever it was made uh it's only set about 40 years before it was being made so historical accuracy for that time period wouldn't have been that difficult if you think about it in the same way that like it's much more easier to make a period drama now about uh what would that be like making something about the 70s um it's like well yeah you should be able to make that accurately (laughs) uh and i do think it's actually a lot more historically accurate than a lot of the historically set films of this era because it's not set that far in the past if you compare it to something like i always think about that laurence olivier pride and prejudice where it's like what 
period did you think you were costuming for? Yeah. Um. Oh, that just made me realize actually it would be the 80s if we were like we're setting a film. Oh my God. And that God. just made me f- no. like I just aged. Nope. I aged. Nope. 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 Um, Which is actually shockingly hard for people to costume. <laughs> <laughs> But it's interesting because the director did really want to make it as historically accurate as possible. Mm-hmm. And part of what made that very easy was that in her no- in her stories, Sally Benson gives these very detailed uh, directions, essentially, which the production designers were able to use. Um, and, you know, they were able to kind of glean everything from that. And you also think, like, if, if you're making a film set in that era, it wouldn't be uh, that hard to get your hands on actual stuff from that time or talk to people who, you know had things uh and knew knew that time intimately so i do think it's a really interesting example of a period drama and a really a really good one uh particularly for the time that it was made in i would agree um it holds up remarkably well if you compare it to the other musicals of that yes. time period i think uh especially even just in terms of you know gender politics and stuff like that um it feels remarkably modern yes. which we will talk about a oh bit my later gosh. but first <laughs> i want to know what you thought of this okay so i saw this movie probably when i was like nine or ten i think my mom and i were trying to figure out like when i had seen this because i've, I've seen most of like the older classic um movie musicals because that was just like what i was raised on <laughs> um so this was the first time i had seen it as an adult and i I was really shocked by how modern it feels. (laughs) Um, Like, 2D is a hoot. And um, I just want to say, as somebody whose, like, most favorite insult is to describe how I'm going to murder someone. (laughs) Okay, you can can probably see this just from what you know of her. Uh, We used to actually call my sister 2D as a child. Because... Oh my god, I really love My sister sister. Hannah and 2D are basically the same person. Um, I think a lot of my personality maybe is actually formed from the fact that I am the Esther to her tootie. So. (laughs) I can see that. But like the things that came out of her mouth shocked me for 1945. (laughs) But then I realized something. So the film came out nine months before the end of World War II. Mm -hmm. And I feel like at that point, people had like reached like a threshold of like unbotheredness. Yep. It's also, if you think, like, often things from the 40s feel more modern than things from the 50s, which I think has to do with, like, you know, values and stuff of those time periods. I think people were a little bit looser in the 40s because they yeah. were really going through it, so they didn't really care. <laughs> and, like, they're, what, like, 10 years removed from the Great Depression? So, like, they've yep. been through a lot, and they were just, like, tough and hardy and, like kids could talk about digging up their Barbies in the cemetery next door (laughs) and how they're going to murder the housekeeper and nobody would blink an eye. But honestly, like there was some, some things in this that I was like, that's a weird choice. Like the bonfire scene, which was just absolutely whack. And I have, um, I have, I have many questions about that. And I'm I'm hoping that maybe you have some answers about that. (laughs) I thought about, I thought about doing a deep dive into like Halloween at the turn of the century for this and I decided to do Christmas instead because I am I do know that like Halloween used to be a very different holiday than it is now um but I really do if any of our listeners know like if that flower thing is real like please do tell me okay so while I was watching this my mom was like yeah there used to be a thing called damage night yep and I was like are you talking about the purge (laughs) And she she was like, no, there was there was a night where people just like destroy each other's property, and I was like, I have so many questions. Yeah. Um. Um. Also, my mom kept pointing out that the hair was not historically accurate. the <laughs> The big bangs was much more of like a 1940s thing when they were filming this mm-hmm. versus a turn of a century thing. Also, I spent the entire movie trying to figure out where I recognized John from, uh, Tom Drake. I was like, oh my gosh, this man's face is so familiar and I cannot figure it out. And then finally it clicked. Lassie. There it is. Yep. He was in all of the Lassie movies. And I I watched all of the Lassie movies as a child because I, I grew up on Turner Classic Movies. <laughs> <laughs> as did I. As did I, man. <laughs> oh, and then I found a fun fact while I was researching that I thought was really interesting. So Margaret O'Brien was not originally cast as 2D. 
So the original girl that was cast as Tootie was the lighting technician's daughter, who had gone so far as to being fitted for her costumes when MGM decided to hire Margaret O'Brien because she was essentially the Shirley Temple of this era. She was the the darling of every, you know, film that needed a child. Mm -hmm. And so they swapped her out for Margaret O'Brien. And um, apparently the technician had a nervous breakdown and in later like interviews, O'Brien seemed very like calm about this. She was like, yeah, he had a nervous breakdown and almost dropped a light on me. And I was like, mm, that doesn't sound like a nervous breakdown. That sounds like premeditated murder. So I looked, I actually found this too. And one thing that I found that like part of what happened was that they originally wanted Margaret O'Brien for the movie mm -hmm. and her mom didn't think they were offering her enough money. So she said no, and they cast this the other girl moms. as a way to be like, well, you know, screw you. We don't need you. Um, and, and then, then they decided that around. they did need her. Yeah. And apparently that lighting technician, like, eventually, like, he spent some time in a mental hospital afterwards. And, like, yeah, it's – I'm like, uh, is that a nervous breakdown or is that, like – revenge <laughs> oh i also found that this was the film that um judy garland started going to therapy mm -hmm. during and then mgm made her stop going to therapy because they couldn't have a star and that needed help there's some fascinating stuff about judy garland in this movie and that like she almost didn't do the movie because mm -hmm. she really wanted to stop playing teenagers being 17 yep but it was the she later talked about it as being one of her favorite roles and she said it was the first movie that she felt pretty in because they gave her a different makeup person who was like what no like um they used to like do weird things to make her nose look different which if you notice like it does look slightly mm -hmm. different in things like wizard of oz and then like this person was like you have a fine nose like i don't know what anyone is telling you it's so weird i see so many things about judy garland not being attractive and i think she is beautiful yep Yep. And I'm like, what is wrong with you people? Even the obituary for the costume designer has a, a snarky comment about how she was able to make the unattractive Judy Garland finally attractive. And I was like, Jesus. she was beautiful. Jeez, you people are mean. No wonder she right? had to go to therapy. Especially like if you think she's 21 at the time that she makes this movie. So if, hey, baby. if she's the one who like finally makes her attractive, we're calling what, like 17 year old Judy Garland unattractive? Like... My God, people. A baby. Um, Old Hollywood is terrible. It's horrific. Uh, everybody, everybody go watch Mank, I guess. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, go watch Hollywood on Netflix. It's mm. better. Um, but yeah, this this is my favorite movie musical of all time. I'm notoriously hard on movie musicals, but this one does it for me. It reminds me, Maggie, you'll get this. It reminds me of the early part, the turn of the century bit in the Carousel of Progress at Disney World. Yes. Like, this film has the same feeling as that, down to, like, the grandfather living in the household. Um, uh, this cast is honestly to die for. Like, I love Margaret O'Brien so much. And I this is by far my favorite Judy Garland performance. I think she... It's of her earlier performances. It really is the one where I think you start to see her come into her own fully. Um, and I think you can see that, like, she, you know, was in a better place, it sounds like, when she was making this movie um i love these costumes so much they're so fun um in a way that i feel like they also aren't exactly what every other period film of that time was because i feel like sometimes period films of that time got stuck in a certain style and this one isn't there's a lot of variety in them which i find really fun like that uh the outfit that she that Judy Garland wears in the opening scene when she's come back from playing tennis with her friends my favorite is just delightful um, I love all the little historical touches in this, though, like the making ketchup in that in that opening bit and like the ice wagon, the way that they let this five year old child just run amok in the neighborhood. Like, it all just feels so quaint now looking at it in 2020. Um, mm -hmm. I also love I love everything to do with sort of relationships. Um, in this, like, I love when Esther's like, well, you know, Rose isn't getting any younger. And it's like, oh my God, leave your older sister alone. But literally my sister makes comments about me. Um, and like, you need to find a boyfriend. You're not getting any younger. Um, I think that this film makes people a hundred years ago feel very relatable without the film itself being like horrifically anachronistic. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, 
like we're seeing these people, you know, pine over the new neighbor and go to parties with their friends and try to avoid having to talk to their crush in front of their family. Um, God, you probably remember younger people won't even remember the horror of like whenever you got a phone call from someone uh, oh my God. and your whole family was around and it was like, oh, this is a house phone. Like, I literally watched that moment. I watched that and I was like, there are so many people who will watch this movie one day and have absolutely no yep. concept of how horrifying how mortifying. It is. Yep. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yep. Um, but it does feel so relatable in so many ways. Um, it made me watching it like now made me feel so nostalgic for Whenever I used to get to go to parties with my friends, like, because I used to go to a lot of parties, you know, kind of similar. Not, I mean, obviously, we weren't like singing songs like this, but, uh, you know, the sort of house party that they throw in in the sort of, I guess, the middle part of this movie. Um, I love the family dynamics in this film. I love the relationship between the sisters and the relationship between the parents. I love the grandfather character. He's so fun. Um, I love yes. the housekeeper, Anna. She's amazing. Um, and I will say, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas is far and away my favorite Christmas song. Um, and it comes from this movie. Judy Garland singing it is my favorite version of it. And I get so annoyed when people sing the happier version of this song. You know, there's those little lyric changes that they mm-hmm. make to make it sound less melancholy. Um, and I'm like, no, that's part of why I like it so much is it is you know, if you think about it within the context of the show, obviously it's it's a quite sad moment for them as a family, but they're also writing it in 1944 mm-hmm. while a war is still going on. Um, and I think that, I don't know, for me, I've had so many Christmases that felt a little bit bittersweet and this song just kind of encapsulates that so well. So obviously. It's so weird to realize how many of our Christmas songs came from this era movies yep. because like white christmas yep. in the 50s mm-hmm. i know i know white christmas like inside and out cause, um, i worked on a production of that but it's like so weird to see these these films that some people probably haven't even seen right? but they know the songs from them yeah i think honestly the songs in this movie are so fun like there's some throwaway ones kind of that just you know are fun in the context of, of it the ones that <laughs> tootie sings oh my god they're so funny though and they're so like honestly there were weird little songs like that at this time oh yeah um, but like the trolley song is so fun you know i just i equate them to to like the weird tiktok yep. trends yeah like there's these weird songs that like everybody sings and then like nobody remembers in like four yep. weeks and that's what a lot of these like weird little, little like bits jingles yeah. the little jingles um, are very but, like, wow i just <laughs> i love the trolley song so much um it Me is too. Generally one of my I sing along to that musical moments in any film ever um i love the boy next door like the amount yes. of times i've sung that, that song <laughs> um, so many times so many times as you remember i did once have a crush on a boy who lived like across from from my apartment yes um <laughs> used to sing that a lot I, I do remember those <laughs> <laughs> and i do love have yourself a merry little christmas so obviously you know it's it's big wins all around for me even the song that the dad sings with the mother is lovely yes um but so one of the things i'm going to talk about because i think one of the most fun parts of this movie is sort of it's set at this time where courtship was turning into dating and we get to see a bit of that with Esther's pursuit of next door neighbor John and also Rose's relationship with Warren as she's kind of like just keeps waiting for him to propose to her (laughs) um oh my god and when he finally proposes oh my god when he like storms in (laughs) I love you um I mean if if a man's not doing that do I want him unclear uh (laughs) it it I know honestly it kind of has like Nick Miller vibes um yes but you know the around this time period people stopped doing the sort of formal courting process that they were doing in the 19th century and it is beginning to give way to what we would now call dating the word date was actually first used in this context in 1896 um in a newspaper article i believe it was a letter to an editor 
Uh, and at this time, young people were starting to have more agency in their relationships. Um, you know, at this time, a lot of times a girl would still have men who would come to call on her in the presence of her family, but she might also go to parties or go to outings with mixed friend groups, which is a lot of what we see in this movie, you know, whenever they go on the trolley to go visit the uh, site for the World's Fair, whenever they have that party for lawns going away. Uh, and it's this mixed group of young men and young women. Uh, and these public outings allowed this sort of privacy that couples didn't have before this in that, you know, they're out in public, but they're away from their parents. Um, the idea of having to only ever encounter a potential, you know, suitor, let's say, with your parents there, I think is so horrific now. <laughs> um, whereas this is a time where you start to kind of get away from that. Um, and that also goes along with the fact that uh, women are going to school and meeting boys in these co-ed schools, even if they are more well-to-do. And so um, you're seeing some of that as well. Obviously, the lower class the couple in some ways, the more freedom they have. Um, upper, upper class women of the time are still very sheltered and not allow the sort of freedoms that a more middle-class girl like Rose or Esther would have been given. Um, I did think it was hilarious. When couples started going on these one-on-one -on -one dates, though, or, you know, what we would consider to be, like, a normal date where, you know, they go to a restaurant and he buys her food, uh, they were sometimes stopped by law enforcement because they were like, oh, no, these women must be prostitutes. Oh, my God. Like, ah, he is buying her a meal. They don't appear to be married prostitution um which is hilarious to me uh yeah like no no <laughs> it's all well and good here <laughs> um i just love that but yeah along with this obviously like part of what this comes from is that as this cultural shifts are going on at this time women are starting to have a you know, identity outside of being a wife and a mother and they're developing interests and hobbies and, and having a life. Like we see Esther coming back from playing tennis. Um, and we see different examples of this throughout. And there's also this increase in leisure time for the middle class, um, especially as we see more and more people living in cities, like, you know, they're living in St. Louis, their dad goes to work in an office. They do some helping around the house, but they also have a uh, housekeeper so they have time to practice piano and stand around singing and go play tennis and bury their dolls in the garden <laughs> and whatever um and so this is also a time where there's uh more mixed gender education even at higher levels of society than there was in the past because girls are finally you know really going to school um and there is still the sense at the time that you were dating to find a partner for marriage. Before she's even met him, Esther has decided that she's going to marry John. Like, yes. Which, hey, that even that feels modern to me. I mean, don't <laughs> we do that every time we're like, yes, this is the one we're going to marry. Yeah. Oh, every, the amount of times you and I have said that to each other. Um, and yet. But, <laughs> and yet we are both unmarried. Um, but at the same time. It's a lot less formal and a lot less, you know, the stress on marriage isn't as much as it was in even the decade before this. Like, it's okay that, you know, uh, Rose is, you know, kind of seeing this guy Warren, but then this other guy gives her a ride home because he runs into her at the store and she's like, oh, you should come and call. And he's like, okay, I will. And that's fine. Like, uh, because she's allowed to play the field a little bit, uh, yes. even though they both are sort of aiming towards that goal still because it was sort of still the the path for a woman at the time but I just think dating in this period is very interesting I think it's partially I grew up reading the Betsy Casey books um and the later ones where they're set in high school have a lot of fun stuff about sort of what dating was like in this time period uh and I just I find it all very fascinating and I also think this is one of the only films uh, that, that is set in this era that does a good job of capturing it. I agree. It feels really natural and not like overdone at all, um, which I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. So now I get to tackle the costumes. And 
Dear listeners, I am going to try to do this very concisely because we are recording this on the night that Taylor Swift is releasing new music. (laughs) So we do have like a plan here, (laughs) which is why we were very giddy. Anyways, um, so the costumes were designed by Irene Schiraff um, or Schiraff. Um, who had a tremendously successful career, particularly in movie musicals. Um, She did the costumes for Brigadoon, The King and I, Funny Girl, West Side Story, to name just a few. Um, But this was her first film where she was the sole costume designer, and she really owned it. Um, She actually went on to win five Oscars over the course of her career. Uh, At the start of the film, there's a very clear style difference between Rose and Esther. Um, Esther is still young. She's 17. She's out playing tennis with her friends, whereas Rose is this more sophisticated older sister who's waiting to be proposed to. Um, And Shroff did really well with capturing this through their contrasting wardrobe. Um, And then as Esther's romance with John blossoms, you can watch as she's given a more womanly wardrobe. Um, You can see that she has gloves. She's working with more fitted waists. um, She has lace and, you know, it's slowly pulling her away from this kind of tomboyish wardrobe. Um, I did find an interesting fact about the red ball gown. Um, It almost didn't make the final cut um, as the Technicolor advisor um, thought that it would overpower the scene and those that she was sharing the scene with, um, which isn't surprising considering red is still seen as a very overpowering color on screen. Um, but this dress became one of Irene's signature pieces, and she became really well known for using reds, oranges, and pinks in her costume design. Um, an interesting point to make is that a lot of films in the 1930s and 40s didn't make a major effort to be historically accurate. Um, Meet Me in St. Louis (laughs) is fairly accurate, um, fortunately, Um, but a film like um, Gone with the Wind, um, which was 1939, uh, isn't historically accurate in terms of costuming. And what's interesting is for those people who aren't historical costuming buffs or people who have made an effort to research costumes, a lot of these films have now shaped the public perception for those eras. So even even today, you'll find people who have seen Meet Me in St. Louis, and they will think of these costumes as an accurate depiction of the turn of the century, just like people will think of Scarlett O'Hara's dresses from Gone with the Wind when they think of the Civil War, even though that wasn't historically accurate at all. Um, And the reason for the, the Gone with the Wind comparison is is because um, Meet Me in St. Louis features um, a scene of Esther having her corset tightened. And it's this very, (laughs) (sighs) very overly done scene of her sister tightening her corset, which is not not how it would be done. And also not quite as painful as they're making it out to be. But it it very clearly reminded me of, of gone with the wind um and the framing with the bedpost and everything so that that's the reason for that comparison um unsurprisingly in terms of costumes my favorite is the striped tennis dress which nicole mentioned earlier in the episode i am a sucker for stripes if you listen to our um sleepy hollow (laughs) episode you know that the striped dress in that was also my favorite dress i just think it is so aesthetically pleasing um but there was also another dress that stood out to me which was in um the ball scene and it was one of the background dancers um it was this really gorgeous gray and red costume um it looked like the skirt was gray velvet and then it had a gray tulle overlay with red um diagonal striped ribbons um, sewn into the the tool and it looked really nice because as she moved the tool would would flutter um, and I'm I'm such a sucker for contra dances I, I used to do contra dances so I, I I made a lot of effort to look at all of the dresses and how they're moving in the scene um, but overall the costumes in this are fairly historically accurate um, I, I really like that tennis dress, though. Um, I love the cuffs, and I love the bow, and I love the belt. And the belt cracked me up, because if you look at the belt that she's wearing with the, the tennis dress, it's very clearly a 1940s belt, and not at all turn of the century, because you will see those belts in vintage stores <laughs> from the 1940s. Um, so that was just like, it was a fun little thing to notice. 
Um, but I really liked how the costumes um, tell a story as the vignettes are telling a story. And it's really, it's, it's an evolution of Esther as she grows up. I love that. Uh, well, obviously, we couldn't talk about this film without talking a bit about Christmas. Um, it, St. Louis, and, Meet Me in St. Louis is an interesting film because it's often perceived as a Christmas movie because it does have a Christmas section that's about about a half hour long, uh, even though it is sort of a set of seasonal, you know, it's seasonal vignettes. The spring section lasts maybe five minutes. Um, it It is, it largely feels like a... Um, fall and winter movie I think but it is like a sort of iconically Christmas movie so I wanted to talk a bit about Christmas traditions during this time I think it's really interesting Christmas actually became a federal American holiday in 1870 Christmas is one of those holidays that actually earlier wasn't as big of a deal and it really became a bigger deal uh, from sort of the 1850s onward in America and really actually kind of amped up during the Civil War. And then by the 1870s was uh, a really big deal holiday and sort of the biggest American holiday. In 1875, I thought this was very interesting, Louis or Louis Prang introduced the Christmas card to America, uh, which became popularized and became a popular thing to send. So know that we have been sending Christmas cards for you know, almost like 150 years. Uh, Christmas trees also became popular in this time. Uh, the Christmas tree tradition <laughs> comes out of Germany. A lot of American Christmas traditions stem from Germany. Uh, but the Christmas tree was also popularized in Britain by the British royal family, who had like co-married a lot with the German royal family. And that later spreads to the United States because... Um, you know, we wanted to copy everything that Queen Victoria and her family did. So they had a Christmas tree. So we all thought we should have Christmas trees. And by the 1870s, it was very normal, especially in, you know, in an upper middle class family to have a Christmas tree. Um, formal Christmas parties and balls like the one that we see in the movie were a lot more popular then. Um, obviously, we don't have a lot of balls anymore, uh, especially... You know, tragically, e even for like a middle class person, it's not that likely to go to a ball. Whereas, uh, you know, may maybe if you're super wealthy, you you've been to ones. I I don't know. Um, I wouldn't know. <laughs> but you know, in in this time in like 1903, that would have been pretty standard. Um, one thing I thought was very interesting was, uh, I was looking into wrapping paper because we see these gifts under the tree. And before the 1870s, 1880s, gift giving at Christmas wasn't a big deal. It was sort of smaller gifts, pieces of candy, little bits, mostly for children. Um, you know, if you sort of think about like in the Little House in the Prairie books, what the Ingalls girls get for Christmas, that's pretty standard. Um, but in the 70s and the 80s, it starts to sort of blossom into this big commercial holiday that we know today. Um, and that comes along with, you know, industrialization and mass production and things like that. Um, gifts were often wrapped in some sort of paper. Often it would be like a plain colored paper that you would buy, red or green, white maybe. Um, Well-to-do Victorians used very decorative paper with lace if you were quite wealthy. Um, and actually in the early 20th century, tissue paper became quite popular. But modern wrapping paper as we know it today was invented in 1917 when the Hall brothers, Rolly and Joyce, uh, started selling these very uh, designed wild patterns uh, in their Kansas City stationery store after they had run out of their normal uh, plain colored ones. Uh, and they started using these like interiors of these French envelopes and then so they made papers based on them and the Hall Brothers store would later expand to become Hallmark interesting right I had no idea that Hallmark went that far back which is funny like a lot of my wrapping paper that I use is from Hallmark uh so it's kind of crazy to think that you know they've they've been doing that for a hundred years and I mean wrapping paper at all is not something that I thought of as being that old um no but whenever I was watching the movie, I was like, huh, would they actually have wrapped their gifts like that? Um, so they would have been wrapped, but probably in tissue paper or in plain colored paper um, or, you know, some sort of brown paper with, with string. Uh, 
another thing that I think is interesting, I think I think there's a mention made uh, of Santa Claus in the film. Um, the image of Santa Claus is this like heavy set man in a red suit with a white beard, sack of toys. Uh, comes from this cartoonist Thomas Nast, who made this drawing in 1881 that sort of created that image, as opposed to the Saint Nicholas image uh, from before, which was slightly different. And then L. Frank Baum, and I find this funny because he is the author of The Wizard of Oz, which is, you know, the movie adaptation of that book is what Judy Garland is perhaps best known for, uh, wrote a 1902 children's book called The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus. And it really helped to popularize Santa Claus across the United States. He'd been, you know, a thing for kids uh, even before this in the 19th century, but that sort of made it uh, even more popular. Mm hmm. And another fun fact that I found about Santa is that the first film featuring Santa Claus is believed to have been made in 1912. Um, obviously, it's one of those weird things sort of you talk about like, oh, the first film to do this because so much of early film has been lost. Mm -hmm. But they think of what we have. It was called Santa Claus and it came out in 1912. So Christmas movies go way back. Nicole, did you mention Santa Claus? Because <laughs> ironically, in 1912, the Postmaster General, whose name was Frank Hitchcock, authorized local postmasters to be allowed to respond to needy children who were mailing letters into Santa. And over a hundred years later, Operation Santa is still in operation, despite DeJoy taking all of DeJoy out of the Postal Service. <laughs> And there are a lot of very depressing stories coming in this year in these letters. I read a CNN article this morning and then I was like, Nicole, we have to talk about this. So we were talking about it. Um, you can go to uspsoperationsanta.com forward slash letters to read through all of the letters that the children um, and some families have mailed in. Um, it is from all across the U.S. And obviously this year has been incredibly hard um, for the world. Um, but the U.S. is definitely leading the way in a really miserable Christmas season. Um, not only with COVID, but with joblessness and just a lot of bad things. And all of these situations are definitely reflected in the letters of the children this year. Um, if you go to the website that I just mentioned, you can adopt a letter and then you can go to the store or order online and purchase the requested items. Um, you then take your purchases to the USPS by December 19th um, and they will match the letter uh, with your purchase and then mail it to the child. Um, it's, the address is kept confidential, so they have a system to match on the backside. Um, and just an example of some of the letters that CNN highlighted this morning in the article I read. Um, one boy named Jonah wrote, Dear Santa, I don't want anything for Christmas, but I would like to ask if you can do me a favor. Can you please find a cure for COVID-19 and give it to us to save the world? Thank you. And another little girl wrote, P.S. I'm sorry I've been bad. It's been really hard because of COVID-19 and online school. I'm trying to be good. I hope you understand. Honestly, I will say, like, beware if you go and read these letters. You will, you will probably cry. You will, you cry. will cry. There's also, I believe, a documentary that's uh, either coming out or just came out about it. It's sitting somewhere in my inbox. <laughs> so I would recommend checking that out. Yeah, it's it's depressing. And I mean, if you think about all of the stuff that's gone on this year, we've had hurricanes, we've had the forest fires, which ravaged the West Coast, um, and just everything else. And tornadoes. tornadoes. I'm like trying to think there's been like, there's been so much, um, and then just so much death in general. And children are the purest beings on earth and it just breaks your heart i'm gonna cry recording this but it just breaks your heart to read their letters and so many of them like obviously there's kids that's like hey i want a playstation so i can play Fortnite," because you know kids <laughs> but then there's other kids that are like i need a new coat for my dad he lost his job and he's having to work this new job and it's outside and he doesn't have a coat <laughs> And it, it's things like that. And, and then one kid was like, uh, my parents think I'm writing this letter to ask for gifts for me and my siblings, but I need these things for my parents so that they can have a good Christmas because they've done so much for us this year. And it just breaks your heart. Children are so pure. And I know that every year that Operation um, Santa, all the children's l letters get adopted, which is like 
So awesome. Um, so if you log on after listening to this and you find that all of the letters have been adopted, um, you should look for your local food banks and homeless shelters um, because they usually do drives this time of year as well to help offset um, the crummy Christmas that a lot of people are having. So that is my, my plea to you at the end of this episode. <laughs> oh, that's so lovely. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think that's kind of all that we wanted to talk about today. I am so glad that we got to talk about this movie and would love to hear from all of our listeners what their favorite Christmas movies are, especially if they have like a Christmas period film that they like. We do have one more film that we're going to be talking about later this month that is also a Christmas themed period film, but we're going to save that and not tell you. Yes. (laughs) It's a secret. (laughs) It's a Christmas secret. You don't get to know your gifts ahead of time. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you all so much for listening to our 14th episode of Petticoats and Poppies, History Girls at the Movies. We'd love to hear from you on social media and to hear what you think of Meet Me in St. Louis. We'd also love to hear what your Christmas movies are, like Nicole just said. You can find us on social media at HGATM Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can also find Maggie at Maggie of the Town, and you can find me at Nicole Ackman 16. You can listen to our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and on the Airglue Media website. And we have recently joined the land of Audible, so you can find us over there as well. If you like what you hear, don't forget to leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts or over on Podchaser if you're listening on Spotify or on Android. Every other episode, we will try to read our reviews, so be sure to leave us one if you want to be featured. As I said, we'll be back soon with another exciting Christmas episode as we continue to look at period films from a history and film perspective. Until then, stay safe and healthy. Happy Hanukkah to those who are celebrating. Yes, happy Hanukkah. (laughs) And have a great holiday season. You've been listening to Petticoats and Poppies. History Girls at the Movies. Interesting.